Hi guys, it's John back again with another model inbox review. Today I'm doing a, an inbox review of a very old kit. And as you can see from the image, we're looking at a Mark I Ferry Battle. The kit I'm looking at is the actual Airfix 72nd scale Ferry Battle. Um, and I've got a boxing of the original release on the red stripe label from 1968 and I'll just show you the uh, boxing history for this very quickly. It's a nice image there of a, a battle. Um, not quite sure where this is but uh, in the foreground there, sorry in the background there, there are actually two, oh, sorry there are actually three gladiators and the ferry battles in the back in the foreground there of the photograph but they're actually behind the gladiators. So I'm not sure where that is, but that is definitely a Mark I Ferry Battle. Um, just take the, uh, the picture off, and this is the first um, issue boxing in the red stripe box. This is a Type 3 box. Airfix released the Ferry Battle in 1968. Um, <clears throat> and I think in 1968, Airfix was the sole uh, builder of a, you know, it's an exclusive kit to Airfix the Battle. 1968 went through to 1973 where we had a Type 4 box. Type 4 boxes, remember, had this sort of greeny colour to the um, Roundel Airfix logo. Um, box was actually the same size and the kit still in Series 2 uh, after being originally released in Series 2. One of the things I find interesting about this particular painting um, is that the battle, the battle in the foreground here has a black underside. The, bat the battle behind actually has a light blue underside, which is unusual because I'm pretty sure that all the battles, the day, the day bomber versions of the battles, actually had light grey undersides. Um, but don't get me wrong, they might have been black. I haven't done the research that in depth at the moment, but we're still looking at that at the moment. Right, um, 1973 went through to 1978 and the kit actually changed series. Uh, when it was re-released in Series 3 in a boxing as a brand new kit. It certainly wasn't a brand new kit. It was the old Series 2 sprues and everything that was in, in even the um, the decals were exactly the same. But it was um, promoted to Series 3 now. Uh, and that was the boxing from 1978. 1986 uh, saw the MB Toys Palatoy rendition on the blueprint box. This is where Palatoy always had their kits made up, uh, showing the made up images of the battle itself uh, on the on the top of a blueprint, which uh, in this case obviously has nothing to do with the fairy battle. I always find it quite interesting that they have these images um, of some sort of aircraft, but it never has anything to do with the subject that's sat on the top of it. Uh, there again you can see that it's series three, plain and simple, there we go. That's 1986, and then in 19, sorry, in 2010, I'm not sure how long the battle actually was was uh, taken off the market, but um, 1986, definitely that boxing went through till I would have thought the, the early 90s, possibly 1990, um, but I don't think Heller ever released the Ferry Battle as a model. They certainly didn't release it as a Heller kit, and when Heller took over Airfix, I don't think they release the kit um, <clears throat> as an airfix kit either but when uh, Hornby got hold of airfix and started re-releasing some of their models they re-released it in the new style red boxing um, that uh, Hornby obviously you know have promoted their kits um, the 2010 offering was also run alongside another kit which uh, came out in 2011 and that's this one this kit was released the year after the red boxing image from uh, the boxing version was released in 2010 and this was the Victoria Cross icons and it actually comprised of all four models you can see in front of you here you had the fairy battle which at that time was a series 3 kit you had the Hawker Mark 1 Hurricane um, I do believe that was the new tool model you had the Bristol Blenheim Mark IV, again, I think that was the new tool model, but I'm not 100% sure, but I think it was. And you also had the Handy Page Hamden, all of which air crew in 1940 to 41 earned Victoria Crosses in, of course. 
Um, right, <clears throat> leave you with a nice image there, the fairy battle. Um, I quite like this image, it's quite a nice rough and battle ready aircraft isn't it? And the fairy battle certainly was a battle ready aircraft ready to be shot down because they were hideously obsolete by the beginning of World War II. We'll just pan the uh, camera down to show you the box I've got here. Let's pan the camera down, it won't take long. There we go. I'm going to try my best to show this as well as I can. This is the kit that's uh, being reviewed today. This is the Type 3 Boxing Red Stripe. You can see it there. The Series 2 offering. The kit is actually serial number 259, but they did change the serial number to A03032 um, later in its boxings up to the present time by Hornby. Um, I'll just take... Whoops, sorry about that. Keep, keep nudging the camera, don't I? I'll just take this uh, box lid off because I don't want to have plastic flying all over the place. I'll just take this box lid off very quickly. The guy who I buy these models from, I don't know why, I'll just use these very quickly to snip this off because I don't really want this. I don't want this anywhere near the box if I can help it as much as possible. Um, there we go, that's better. One of the things I learned about the boxings that Airfix produced in the 60s and early 70s is that they actually had um, adverts advertising their other kits. And they usually were kits from the same scale as a Series 2 Blenheim Mark IV there. And they also did a Vault Kingfisher in Series 2. Um, and then you have the old, tall Mosquito. And a kit I'd really like to get my hands on, but they're quite rare. It's a Beagle Bassett. These kits are all in Series 2, of course, um, which is nice. What I'll do, I'll just take the plastic out of this. Actually, it's probably easier if I just tip the plastic out and put it into the lid. And then when we go through the plastic in a minute um, to have a look at the bits and bobs that are in here, I can put everything back into the box. We'll, just, we'll deal with that in a minute. Just want to quickly show you these are blasts from the past. I've got two of these in here. I don't know why I've got two of these. Perhaps Airfix decided they want to put two of these in. But these are complaint slips. These are the slips that you had in every Airfix kit um, going right through to probably when uh, Heller got hold of them when the slips changed. But these slips were very similar in this format. Uh, they, they had Airfix Productions Limited on there, Department C, Haldine Place London, which is obviously their old HQ, and Holdings in London. And on the front, this is really, really interesting. On the front, it's marked Airfix Checklist. Have you got them all? Well, they've actually got a list there of everything that they produce models of. Um, it's quite small print, so you probably won't be able to see a huge number of them, but there are an awful lot of kits in their range. Even in 1968, there were a lot of kits in their range. But I always think that's quite nice to have a checklist so you can see what kits <laughs> you had built, hadn't built, and would fancy building. We'll start off with the instrument, uh, the instruction leaflet. The instruction leaflet, obviously from a red stripe box, these go back to when I think instructions were... Good fun. The instruction leaflet is very typical of Airfix in the, in the late 60s, even mid 60s. Um, you had lots and lots going on each step, uh, and the kit built up in three steps. The third step being the paint guide there, as you can see, and the second and first step being construction guides, and there's an awful lot going on. But the thing I liked about Red Stripe boxings, and even later actually, because some of the the Roundel boxes, Type 4s, had these types of instruction leaflets in them, but they didn't ver stay very long in the Type 4s and 5 boxes. But in the Type 3, you'll always have this style of instructions, and this is why I really like these types of instructions. I'll explain. In the top of the instruction leaflet, you've got the Airfix construction kit and the, the, the gump that you usually get, you know, the history of the aircraft, specs and everything else. And instructions that says paint all details and let dry before assembly. That's basically what they said. It, you know, it's assembly instructions read before um, you commence assembly. And the thing that's interesting is, yeah, you've got nice pictorial images here of the parts. 
but the parts are not very clearly ID. If you look very carefully, there are no arrows on any of those parts to suggest where they go. None at all. But the interesting thing is, is that in the text, they're not expecting you to put all these parts together in step one, all in one go. In the text, it actually tells you not just what order to build the part the, 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 the kit in, but also what the parts are actually called. For instance, um, it says, number one, locate and cement tab at rear of pilot seat part one into the slot in the seat bulkhead part two, which relates to this seat and the bulkhead part two there. You can see that. So what they're actually telling you to do is to cement that part into the hole in the, in the back of the bulkhead for the pilot seat. And it's like that all the way through the instructions. It actually tells you exactly how to do everything, what to do at each stage. And I I really like these instructions. Now, when I was a child, I, I think I've mentioned this in one of my videos last year. But when I was a child, I found this style of instructions quite bewildering. They were quite difficult for me to, to ascertain what to do. And obviously, when with other children, lots of mistakes probably were made, which is why they changed the format of the instructions. Um, but as an adult... I find this style of instructions really interesting, um, also because they tell you exactly what the parts are called, which sometimes are difficult to know what the parts are called. Um, cement machine gun part 55 onto the locating hole on the leading edge of the starboard wing. And then it says bombs are optional. If bombs are desired, cement the bomb halves together and then cement the bomb fins Part 65 to 68 to the ends of the bombs. So they're telling you exactly what the parts are actually called um, and when and how to do everything. It's really it's self-evident, but it's I always find it interesting. The paint guide covers two different versions on this kit. There's a Belgium Air Force aircraft and a Royal Air Force aircraft. Um, the Belgium aircraft, I think, was serving in the Belgium Air Force in the Belgian region. Um, and the RAF aircraft was... It was weird because the bomber formations were actually part of the RAF's contingent in, at the time of the Battle of France and throughout the Phony War, but they weren't attached to part of the expeditionary force at all. They actually operated completely separate, and that's where an awful lot of the mistakes and why a lot of mistakes were made in the Battle of France, because there was no coordination between the land forces and the air force and the way in which they... Um, I got hacked to shreds, it showed there. Decals, just have a quick look at the decals. The decals on this kit are quite old, um, but they're in pretty good nick, actually. They're, they're reasonable nick, and I think the decals will hold together for, to enable me to apply them. The thing is, um, I might not need to use these decals. I'll probably need to use the, um, the roundels and the fin flashes. But that PHF I certainly won't because I'm not going to be building a Mark I bomber. I'll explain exactly what I'm doing with this particular kit because this is going to be part of my Bomber Command buddy build model with three other kits that I'll be building alongside in two separate projects. Um, I'm also going to be building a diorama base, hopefully with um, a hanger attached to it. And I'll explain what's going to go on with that um, at a, later, at a later date in a different video but these these transfers they are quite workable they're they're not particularly good um cartograph they certainly aren't there's quite a lot of carrier film on them as well and the carrier film appears to be quite yellowy which belies the transfer's age and the quality of the transfers belies the fact that they were printed in 1968 um but they are serviceable they'll, they'll produce a reasonable uh, effect now then <clears throat> something else you used to get a lot of in uh, early 60s and 70s models from Airfix was a display stand. This is very typical of the type of display stand that you got. Um, they're not multi-positional. Um, they're not particularly fabulous stands, but they do do the job satisfactorily. These are quite marketable, um, and I've noticed that Airfix do resell re uh, some of these stands as actual model sets accessories so you can buy them as set complete sets 
uh, and they're, they're exactly the same as these. They've used the same moulds and everything. Now then, transparencies. We'll, use, we'll have a quick look at the transparencies first because lots of people like to see what the quality of the transparencies are like. And I'm looking at these and they're okay, aren't they? They're not particularly crystal clear, but the frames are quite nicely moulded on them. Um, they're not fantastic quality, but they're not bad. The, they're what I would call satisfactory. Similar in quality, I would say, to the Dauntless. The actual mouldings of the airframe, cabinet, the cockpit canopy frame there are quite pronounced. And they'll paint up quite nicely. But the actual quality of the, the plastic itself is not fantastically clear. Although that large birdcage section doesn't seem to be too bad. If I bring the camera a bit close to the, to the part there, you can see, you can't really see my fingerprints through it, but... You can, you will see detail through that canopy. So you know the canopy's satisfactory. It's okay. Now then, we'll have a quick look at the loose parts. There are a number of loose parts in here. Um, I won't have to go manically through each one, but I just want to show you the difference between some of these parts because they're quite interesting. I'll just put the other loose parts, which are copied up. The fuselage half is quite a sizable plane, the ferry battle. Um, it's going to be about seven inches long, which is quite interesting. It's quite a large plane. That's easily as long as a Mosquito. It is quite a large kit um, in 72nd scale. And the thing that I found quite interesting about this particular kit, like the Dauntless, uh, when I built the Dauntless from Airfix, the interior, although you can't see it very well here, when I've looked at the instructions to see what you get inside the interior, it's, it's actually quite detailed. There is actually a cockpit floor. Um, there is quite a detailed interior to this, so you, and you're going to see quite a lot of it through that canopy. But the thing I also quite like about this particular moulding on this kit is that, yes, you've got the usual rivets, you know, rivet city and everything, but the battle was riveted together, and it wasn't flush riveted together, so the rivets on this kit should show, and they're not particularly pronounced the rudder's nicely molded the the rib the ribs and liners they're all raised obviously because you know you didn't have recessed panel lines in those days but it's not overdone and if i can bring this into focus for you i'm hoping you can see the detail on the engine cowling especially on the underside of it where there are quite a lot of um it's not going to do it is it there are quite a lot of nuts and bolts and screw fixings on that, those cowling hoods and the actual side cowlings of the engine bay there on the front of that fuselage. It's actually quite nicely moulded. The quality and the crispness of the moulding is actually quite good, although I should, you know, I would be expecting the crispness of the moulding to be quite good because it's in a Type 3 box when the kit was released. This is the upper wing, which has the, uh, the bomb rack mounts there. And the upper wing surface is, not, again, it's nicely moulded. The detail on the moulding is actually quite nice. The, the ribs for the wing there and the rivets going all the way down the edge, but the ribs themselves are actually quite faithfully depicted. You might need to sand those down slightly, but I wouldn't have said not too much because they're, they're not overdone. And it's a nice... It's a nice looking part. It's quite nicely crafted. I like that. The underside of the wing, you've got lots of gaps here for the bomb. The, the bombs are recessed in the battle. It was quite a modern fighter, but by the time World War II broke out, the actual concept of the ferry battle's use in battle was pretty obsolete. Um, and the aircraft was in, woefully inadequately protected. By protective machine guns it was just a, it was a flying target for the German Air Force to be honest with you um, the underside of the wing ribs there again they're quite nice they're not overdone it's a nice nicely crafted piece of work and the flaps they're fabric covered obviously flap, flaps on the underside of the wing there and they're quite nicely molded as well quite like the way in which this kit's been been put together I like it now then We'll have a quick look at some of these sprues. I'm not going to go mentally into them. The propeller. The propeller on the battle was exactly like that. It was pretty pr 
pathetic, to be honest with you. It was a pathetic propeller. Not particularly um, endowed with blade finish and stuff like that. But it wasn't a bad, and you know, it wasn't a bad prop um, in terms of you know what the what the aircraft was supposed to do. And the recreation of the propeller on the Airfix kit is actually really, really good. It is exactly like that. Very nicely molded. The actual um, casing for the propeller bus is is there. Everything is all in the right place, so that's really good. I also want to show you these these very typical Airfix pilots. Lots of people don't like the Airfix pilots, but I love them. I think you know they bring my child back childhood back to when I was painting these guys up when I was about 10 years old um, which is great really really like those guys on there so that's that um, the other parts here that's the bomb doors the covers for the bombs uh, the bomb fins there's a there's one missing off here but you know I'll show I don't really need to show you the loose bomb fin but the parts on on this kit they're quite nicely molded there's not a lot of flash there's very little burr there are a few tabs here and there there's a little bit of flash on those tail planes as you can see but they'll clean up quite nicely again the tail planes and the the aileron there is quite nicely molded um, there are the exhaust stubs obviously similar in concept to the hurricane and spitfires exhaust stubs from mark ones um, and the battle was no exception. One of the interesting things about the battle that a lot of people don't realise is the battle beat the Hurricane uh, by a couple of months to being the first RAF aircraft in frontline service to be powered by a Merlin engine. It beat the Hurricane by about two months in 1936. Um, the Spitfire was miles behind quite a lot of aircraft. These parts are very, very nicely moulded. That's the undercarriage oleos there. There's a bulkhead, there's floor pans, the wheels, they're all faithfully crafted and very nicely reproduced. Uh, you know, it's, it's a nicely detailed, nicely detailed kit. The other parts in there are all just basically, <clears throat> they're all just basically bits and bobs that have dropped off the sprue. There was, there was something in there I did want to show you. There is, no it isn't, that's not it. It's fallen through I think. It's got a nicely detailed, and there it is, I've got it. It's got quite a nicely detailed instrument panel as well. Um, I'm hoping that will come into focus for you there. Bring into focus, there you go. This is a separate part that goes onto the forward bulkhead, and then it's glued into position onto the floor pan of the forward cockpit bay. And that is pretty faithful as well, because I've seen a battle instrument panel off a real aircraft. There aren't many left, but there is a couple here and there, and that is pretty close to what the battle's instrument panel looked like. The interior of the aircraft is actually interior green, and the instrument panel will be rendered in black, probably a semi-matte black. So that's the inbox review done. The parts, they are quite nicely moulded, um, and the kit does appear to be quite nicely detailed. Finish not bad either. Right, I'll just go quickly through the um, the gumph and the technical information on the kit itself so I can close this video down. Um, the kit itself is an Airfix Ferry Battle. The kit is moulded in 172nd scale and it comes in Series 2 with a serial number of 259. It was later reissued in Series 3 with a serial number of 03032 and the new Hornby releases of the serial number A03032. There are decals for two versions in the box, an RAF and a Belgium Air Force aircraft, and the dimensions of the kit will be around about seven inches long by a nine inch span and two and a half inches high. There are 72 parts on four grey plastic sprues and six parts on a clear sprue, totaling 78 parts in total. Options and costs, there aren't that many options. The Battle is not a particularly popular kit by companies to build, but there are a number of quite nice options available. In one 144 scale, Svesda do a ferry battle, and that kit usually retails for between 2 to 3, but I have seen it as high as 5 quid. In one seventy second scale, obviously you have the Airfix ferry battle, that kit retails for between 6 and £18. Pound. The Airfix Victoria Cross Icon set retails for between £20 and £40. Pound. 
usually if you get the newer renditions it's about 40 quid the bilek kit which is actually a fairy battle airfix sprue model is it would cost about five to ten pound and npm do a production sorry npm production models do a fairy battle and a fairy battle t mark one and a fairy battle tt mark 10 and those kits retail for about 15 to 20 pound sk models do a fairy battle again this is the old airfix kit and that retails for between seven and twelve pound in 148 scale there is a really nice set of three different boxings from classic airframes one of the Ferry Battle Day Bomber, one of the T-Mart 1, and one of the TT Mark 10. And these retail for between £25 and £59, depending on the version and the quality and the standard of model. Um, it is worthy of note also, before I move into the conclusions, that there are three major versions of the battle which can be mold, uh, modelled, and they are covered by uh, companies in 72nd and 48th scale. The standard Day Bomber is similar to the... Um, but the airfix kit is just basically a day bomber um, with a rear gunner. But there were conversions of the battle um, which were turned into T Mark 1s, and these had a separate second canopy. The birdcage long canopy was taken away, and you had a, sepan, a second rear canopy. Um, and these were utilised as trainers to teach pilots how to fly the battle and how to utilise it in battle. They also did conversions and actual uh, production build versions of the target tug variant um, and this kit was basically a standard ferry battle with the rear gunner's position uh, laid empty but the gunner's position still had the position there it just didn't have a machine gun and that position was used for observing the drone that was dragged out the back from a ventral bay and also to observe if you like liaise with the, the gunner's training to show how the gunners were doing um, so yeah, the reason why I'm telling you about the, the trainers, the, the trainer and the TT models for target tugs is because in the buddy the buddy build for the Bomber Command run, which is done by the IBM in America, I'll be building a target tug variant of the ferry battle. I won't be building a day battle, a day bomber version of the battle. And the conversion of this kit is not very hard. Um, some of the variants were harder to model. But the T Mark, the TT Mark One and TT Mark Three, were just general conversions with a ventral release mechanism under the rear of the centre section of the wing, um, and these released the drone through a long cable which just dragged it, towed it behind, um, and they were just basic day bombers, often um, relegated to target tugs from day bomber duty, and these were very, very quickly converted for training and logistical roles and support roles like target tugs uh, and that's that's the variant of the aircraft that i'll be building for the buddy build now then conclusions now the plans and the decals they do show their age but i like the red stripe airfix plans with their info and clear id of all the parts there doesn't appear to be any fit issues from any of the reviews that i viewed online and the raised panel lines and rivets don't look that bad, so I'm not expecting them to be a headache to sand down all the way, all the time. The interior is reasonably detailed for the age of the kit, with a cockpit floor and instrument panel included, as well as a gunner's floor and options for an open or closed gunner's position. But all in all, it's not a bad kit to recommend, and looking forward to this build, I would strongly recommend the Airfix kit. It's quite cheap and cheerful. It's not as good as, say, the NPM variant for accuracy but it's certainly reasonable. The outline of the kit is pretty good. Um, but if you were after a, a really, really good faithful reproduction, I would go for the classic airframes because that kit is absolutely superb, but it is quite pricey. So that's the model inbox review for the Airfix Ferry Battle. I hope this video has been of some use. Um, thanks for joining in. Um, thanks for um taking the time out to listen to this video i really appreciate any comments um, and thank you for listening may all your model projects go really well smooth modeling lads bye for now bye bye